claiming that many ordinary Germans willingly took part in the Holocaust and that more were fully aware of it has been causing deep controversy in Germany. The study by an American academic, Daniel Goldhagen, disputes the accepted view that crimes against the Jews were carried out by just a small number of Nazi sympathizers. For the young generation in today's Germany, the Holocaust is a compulsory subject. At the Goethe School in Dusseldorf, the sixth form is learning about the terror, the mass killings, and the hatred of Jews in Nazi times. Here have the Hitler Jugend, BDM, who that. Faced with the evidence, the pupils are driven to ask themselves the age-old question, how could it have happened here? A new study has raised high alarm. Eager crowds gathered in Hamburg for a televised debate with Daniel Goldhagen. His book, Hitler's Willing Executioners, says the unpleasant truth about the Holocaust has been brushed aside. These were ordinary Germans who came from all walks of life, many of whom knew they didn't have to do what they were doing because they were told that by their commanders and who instead of acting reluctantly were doing as little as possible on the whole acted with zeal and did more than they have to and acted with great cruelty. The unearthing of the death camps like Belsen showed how mass murder had gone on under the eyes of the German population. In his book, now a bestseller in Germany, Goldhagen concludes that virulent anti-Semitism was the key to the Holocaust. His critics say it's wrong to put a whole society in the dock. His key is too, uh, it's too simple to say that uh, the anti-Semitism, and uh, with this anti-Semitism I can explain all what happens in, uh, in this uh, century in Germany, uh, it's not correct. In Dusseldorf, the old Gestapo headquarters in the heart of the city has become a museum recording everyday life under the Nazis. Each generation has tried to come to terms with the fact of mass murder. This museum was only opened after younger Germans questioned why town clerks and tradesmen had joined in the work of the Holocaust. The theory of a nation of willing executioners has caused anguish, but also a new search for truth about the painful past. William Horsley, BBC News, Dusseldorf. A growing number of families are being forced to live apart because of a lack of affordable homes, according to the housing charity Shelter. A new study to mark the organization's 30th anniversary shows a 50% increase in what it calls split households. Shelter is calling on the government to provide thousands of extra homes for rent to ease the situation. Look, can't really come on today. Okay. Susan Hall's only regular contact with her husband is by phone. Unable to get work locally, he left the family's rented home in Plymouth for a job in Wiltshire. But the early promise of a council house there failed to materialise. His low wages make regular trips back impossible, and the long weeks apart are already affecting the children. Dan's four. It's affecting at school. He's, he's quite withdrawn at school, and um, he gets easily upset. David's 200 miles away. Nobody can tell us if we'll be rehoused or when we'll be rehoused. Um, the financial situation is quite desperate at the moment. Launching the report, Shelter said that government figures showed a sharp increase in the number of households forced to live apart, even though the law says that families shouldn't have to separate simply because they don't have a home. Government policies are forcing families apart. The cuts in income support or mortgage payments for homeowners, the cuts in benefit for tenants, um, the lack of investment in affordable housing, the weakening of the safety net for homeless families, all those are measures which force families apart. But the Department of Environment accused Shelter of misinterpreting official figures, which include not just families like the Halls, but those split by separation or divorce. The charity insists much of the problem is hidden and far greater than the thousand families a year that come to them for help. John Andrew, BBC News. The racing driver Damon Hill has been talking for the first time about what he says is his deep disappointment at the Williams team's decision to sack him at the end of the season. He said it made him even more determined to win the race for the World Drivers' Championship. Uh, I've leading the championship all season and have won, uh, as I said, seven races. I'm still leading the championship by a healthy 13 points with three races to go. And uh, my view is always that um, the, the reward for uh, winning races should be the opportunity to, to continue to drive uh, the best equipment. The father of tennis champion Steffi Graf has gone on trial in Germany on charges of tax evasion. Peter Graf is accused of failing to pay £8 million of tax on his daughter's earnings. 
If convicted, he could face a 10-year jail sentence. Peter Graf used to enjoy the limelight, but today's publicity certainly wasn't welcome. The Svengali, who controlled every moment of his daughter's rise to the top, came to court after 13 months in prison. Thick files on the court shelves contain allegations that he evaded £8 million of tax, half Steffi Graf's earnings. The judges were told she knew nothing about her financial affairs, leaving everything up to her father. The trial, likely to last four months, has aroused great interest here. Only the star of the show is missing. Steffi Graf is thousands of miles away in New York, qualifying for the semi-finals of the US Open despite the intense strain, suspicious that the trial is time to coincide with the Grand Slam tournament. I have no idea how that happened or how they do it. I don't know. German banks know the accusations against Peter Graf could easily apply to thousands of others here. The banks are alleged to have helped many people move money out of the country in recent years, away from punitive levels of tax. Detailed accounts from one bank are now being studied by the authorities. Tax evasion has become a national sport. Bank clerk Werner Demant says he personally transferred millions of pounds to Luxembourg, a small part of the billions sent abroad. The graph case and taxes are debated hotly here. People think tax reform is now long overdue. Many Germans sympathize with the Graf family's plight. The size of their tax bill may be unusual, but it has highlighted a serious problem here. Jonathan Charles, BBC News, Frankfurt. A scientist is claiming that dogs can read human minds. His research seems to show that nearly half know when their owners are about to leave work and return home. He says that some cats, birds and even pet snakes share the same psychic bond. Rita Chakrabarti reports. For JT, the Mongol Terrier, love means knowing exactly when his owner is coming home, before she's even set out. Pam Smart can return by bicycle, car or on foot and at any time of the day. JT, her pet for seven years, seems to know instinctively that she's set out. The two took part in research which involved placing a video recorder in the house with JT. When Pam started preparing to come home, JT would rush to the window. I've been asked today whether he can pick the lottery numbers and, uh, you know, whether he does the ironing and that kind of thing, and unfortunately the answer is no. I think this is um, wonderful enough, really. Telepathy or coincidence, scientists are divided. These dogs were left together in a room for several hours with their owner in another part of the house. When she thought about taking them out, they perked up. Dr. Rupert Sheldrake has some 400 hours worth of videotape showing what he says is the bond between master and dog, cat, hamster and even pet snake. Many dismiss his theories, but he's convinced. I call it a morphic field. I think it's an invisible link between the person and the dog. It's a, this, this field is the field of a social group. They're part of a social group. And these fields are invisible connections which enable communications to pass. <coughs> Traditionally, dogs bark at impending doom and rats leave a sinking ship. It may be some time, though, before the mind-reading pet is taken seriously by all. Rita Chakrabarti, BBC News. Put the kettle on spot. And that's the rush we get. Imagine riding at 40 miles per hour through the city where ASAP just ain't quick enough. Experience the need for speed Sunday at 9 on BBC Two.